today I want to talk about something quite different in many respects um, to, to where we've been going so far, and that's really to kind of look at connected devices. Connected devices, you know, right across um, the whole internet, if you like. Um, Green Hill Software, who are we? Just really quickly, because um, I don't suppose, apart from Saab here, probably most people don't know who we are. Um, we're actually an embedded software company. Started 30 years ago, our first product was a compiler for Apple. Um, and we do all sorts of things in the embedded space. That means our customers are, are, are people like Lockheed Martin and Boeing and, and um, Audi and different car manufacturers and so on. We have different divisions that do different technologies and I'll be touching on some of those things as we go through today. Um, in our space, you know, people like Hewlett Packard and Lockheed Martin, Ford, Boeing, Toyota and people like that that are making these devices um, over the 30 years now that we've been in business have been trusting us to um, enable them with the right technology to do all these clever um, systems. One of the latest is actually the, the train in the corner here, um, which is from Bombardier, where they're doing a safety system which is using multiple multi-core processors um, and replaces a system which was lots of plug-in cards, because when trains go between countries, um, they actually have to be programmed with different safety systems for different countries. So little men were running all around the world with, with lots of cards and plugging them all in for depending where that train was going. Um, and uh, as you imagine, that cost a lot of money. Um, that system is now being replaced by a multiple multi-core um, processor safety system running um, our operating system technology, which is pre-certified and then bought specific stuff, which is we've taken through certification for the customer and then the customer has different safety applications for each country and they all go through certification processes as well. We'll talk a bit more about some of those things as we go along, but in our world, in the embedded space, there's lots of different classifications of security and, and, and safety and reliability um, bodies and applicability and things like that. Um, in our industry sector, we have more than anybody. Um, but really today I just want to talk about all these connected devices and um, I was just cruising uh, uh, as one does around the internet and, and Beecham had this very good chart which isn't so probably clear from the back but you know there's all these different application areas and there's all these devices that connect to the internet everything from your your oven which if it doesn't connect at the moment probably will do shortly um, you know, to your car is now having connections, your, obviously your, your, your phone, medical devices, um, lots of devices connect to the, inter the internet, as you know, smart meters, all those types of things. So what about, uh, what about that world? You know, I mean, even, hey, you know, routers and things like that. I mean, they're all out there, aren't they? Wireless valves, um, we've all heard of Stuxnet and those sort of issues. Lots of things going on in that space, and we'll touch on some of that as well. Um, so, what's our trust um, in these connected devices? Um, you know, medical devices, power plants, automotive electronics, avionics systems, point of sale, smartphones. Um, I know plenty of people who really feel like this about it, um, um, but probably all of us would agree that for the most part, those things are outside of our control and we've, we've got to, 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 you know, trust the systems. Actually, some of the safest systems on that list are, are actually avionics systems and, and automotive electronics. Um, but, uh, you know, a good policy is um, really try not to connect things directly to the internet, which seems a bit strange these days because nearly all of these, you know, devices have IP addresses as do inter internet connected ovens. Um, the whole purpose of your internet connected oven is so you can turn it on from the office. Um, you know, there's sites you can go on and you can type in um, different information and it says, oh, by the way, you know, this was a, a PLC, so an industrial um, automation controller or network device. Um, how many of those can you see on the internet? And you can go to a site and you can put it all in and it says, well, there's 65 in the US and there's 16 there and here's all the IP addresses and, and these are all the ports that are open and, and all this sort of stuff and this is the actual device that's connected and, and off you go. Is as simple as that. Because a lot of the infrastructure, you know, a lot of what we're talking about today is this stuff in front of us, our computers, our servers, 
um, or some of the, the physical interactions that, that we do in terms of passwords and getting access to things. Um, we mustn't forget that behind the scenes there's all, this, all these devices talking and you know, well, how secure are those? Um, in a lot of cases, particularly when you look at the whole area of power and water and, 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 and other types of um, supply, pretty insecure actually. Quite a lot of the, the, those embedded devices, those, those devices that control valves or pumps or things like that, have no security at all. There's plenty of stories on the internet you, you can Google for yourself um, where you'll find that you know, somebody made a nice antenna with a Pringles tube, um, pointed at a wireless valve and managed to, to open the valve and, and in that case spill sewage everywhere. Um, and it was yeah a mess. Um, but very easy to do. Um, so if you're going to connect things to the internet, um, to you as an audience this probably seems quite obvious, but actually to the, the embedded world, um, the engineers developing these products and things like this, this isn't always as obvious as it would appear to you. Can I take major offence with the last bullet? Which one's that? For remote access, use a VPN? Yes. Well, yeah, no, I wouldn't even do that. Use but a secure protocol, don't yeah. use a VPN. Right. Um, fail first, patch later. Um, this again talks about SCADA, supervisory control and data acquisition, so this is all industrial control systems. Um, you know, you can get access to, to this information later, but you know, you'll see from these, these highlighted areas here that, you know, through Stuxnet and, and through other mechanisms, um, these attacks still occur. In a lot of cases, big organizations are not doing anything quick enough um, about fixing some of these issues. They still exist, they'll exist for a long time, um, maybe tens of years before um, in some cases these, these equipment are replaced with more secure systems. Um, Bruce Schneier was quoted earlier um, today as well. The only path towards software security is through high assurance. In other words, critical software must be designed for security in the beginning. That, that security claim must be certified by independent experts and security must be field proven. In our embedded space, this is really important. Um, and the approach that is uh, taken, um, that, that we have taken as a company and is, is highly recommended in, uh, in security and safety and high reliability applications is to use an operating system or or separation kernel that itself directly controls the hardware. So all of your applications and everything live um, above that level. Um, they live in memory compartments. Um, you notice the brick wall partitioning here. So what the operating system or, or actually a separation kernel, it's a very small operating system. Operating system um, people generally think of things like Windows and Linux and things like that, which are many tens of millions of lines of codes, uh, lines of code. Um, what I'm talking about here as a separation kernel is, is in the tens of thousands of lines of code size. Um, what this does is it, it controls um, all of the assets of the hardware that um, the device drivers themselves, unlike many common desktop operating systems, live outside of this space. They live in separate memory partitions, which are controlled by the um, processor, um, and you have your third party in, uh, internet stacks, different applications, all running in different spaces. And then if any one of these systems fails because of a bug or is hacked, then the underlying uh, separation kernel can actually determine, oh yes, something's gone wrong here, and do something about that. So protection in you know, separation of different applications is really important, um, but protection in the time domain is important too. So if you're controlling something in the, in the cockpit of an aircraft, um, and then something is not going quite right on that particular controller, um, and something's supposed to happen every uh, second, for example, you need to know that that is going to happen every second. Um, so the separation kernel has the ability to um, control on a time as well as a space basis. So 
the system can never get locked up and all the CPU resources get consumed by just one application that's gone rogue. You as the architect can say I want to, to time divide this such that application A gets 20% of the time and this one gets 5% and this one gets 5% and so on. And that's always guaranteed. And that's, you know, that's quite uh, a different model often than you're used to working in the, in the desktop space. Um, by the way, I, I'm assuming everybody does know that, that, that all our jet airliners today are completely flown by computers, right? There's not, there's not really any manual control per se left in, in jet airliners and there hasn't been for 20 years. Um, you know, we all trust um, planes to, to, to take off and fly around and, and land every day um, and it uses technology like this to, to do that. Um, Everybody wants their computer to be secure. We've talked about a lot of these things today. Um, anyone who's got a grudge against you, of course, the human factor. Um, even the, the guys that, uh, that drop USB keys in, in car parks because they want to break into your computer systems. You know, that's, that's, the, that's what people do these days, is they drop a nice big juicy 16 gig stick in your local council car park with a, with a uh, a little nasty on it and what's the first thing somebody does oh of course not uh, not any councils down here because you've got policies against that but um, in other places they pick it up and they take it straight into the office and they plug it in and then the guys are waiting on the outside saying oh last now we've got access because it's opened open the way forward um, or you know maybe somebody's actually got into your company Facebook profile and um, is actually socially working that group and then spring something on everybody. There's all sorts of tricks that, that go on that you guys probably know much more about than me. Um, who's heard of common criteria? Hooray! Um, that's good. Um, so most people have, which is good. Uh, it's a scale from level 1, EAL 1, to level 7. Um, assurance levels. Um, most desktop operating systems and virtualization systems are at around EAL 4 or 4 plus. They kind of live in this sort of space here. Um, sort of medium robustness, different firewalls and, and Linux and Windows and, and things like that. Um, and the actual definition, if you, if you read your common criteria document, is um, at EAL 4 plus even up here, um, this is only suitable for protecting against inadvertent or casual attempts to breach system security. So, you know, if the cat wanders across the keyboard, then, then it's probably not going to be able to get in. Um, but it's not secure by anyone's definition, and particularly in the embedded space with the customers that we're, we're working with a lot, um, this level of security is, is wholly inadequate. Um, a lot of them don't have second names for some reason. As well. Oh, well, I don't know what that's all about. Um, so, what we had to do actually, and I'll, I'll show you the proof point in a minute, was um, we had to certify to EAL6+, plus, which is like right up here, high robustness. So it's EAL6 with some, some extensions to it. Um, at this level up here, you've got to do formal methods analysis, you've got to do all sorts of um, documentation, calculation. Um, it all has to go through a, through a lab, in this case NIAP and NIST. Um, in this case um, that I'm going to show you next, um, the, the product, the software, all the source code for the software all had to go to the NSA. The NSA um, actually spent three and a half years um, going over it, um, which when you look at the size of the application is quite surprising, but the end result um, was a certificate um, for the company to um, EAL 6 plus high robustness, which is what this certificate talks about. And well, why did we need that? There's the level there, by the way. Um, why did we need that? Well, it was this aircraft here, which is the F-35. Um, so what they wanted to do on the F-35, this is Lockheed Martin, um, what they wanted to do is they wanted to bring up multiple levels of data onto a single computer. And of course, in the security world, that's like, no. Um, you know, a lot of our customers in, in US federal and, and, um, and military circles 
are the types of guys that have got a computer here and a computer here and a computer here. Um, you know the types, right? And a separate Ethernet coming out here and one here and one here. So the idea that you could bring this and this and this onto a single computer on the plane didn't really excite too many people. Um, but um, the end result is it was certified after three and a half years um, and is done and then it was done again. Um, and uh, to date, um, which is something the NSA are less happy about, um, we're the only company who's achieved this. And that, um, that occurred back in, what, 2008. And the evaluation started in 2005. Um, and today there's no one else that um, has that. Um, which, as I say, from a competitive standpoint, isn't, isn't very good. Um, but what it does is it, pro it proves separation. Because you've got people looking at this, they're looking at the source code, they're looking to try and break it and, and get into it. This is, kind of, this is kind of where it's at for a lot of our customers with their embedded devices, whether they're planes or cars, as in the example at the bottom. Um, the other thing that you might want to do, and our, some of our customers do, is they want to run high criticality and low criticality applications on a single CPU or they want to run certified and uncertified on the same CPU. Now, any of you who have ever been into you know, a lot of this certification processes and things like that will know that often what you have to do is you have to recertify the whole system. Um, and that can be very expensive. Um, in avionics terms and avionics software, a lot of time is spent um, checking and and, and, and proving the quality of the software and going through these certification processes. Um, but what we can do, based using the separation that I was talking about, um, is we can enable certified and uncertified on a single CPU or high and low um, criticality. Um, separation in consumer space, um, you know, this is, this is a hot topic right now next generation infotainment and uh, clusters and, and ADAS in cars. Um, did you know that within a few years, by the way, to get the highest end cap rating on your car, your car is going to have to make an avoidance maneuver if somebody walks out in front of it? Um, that's not something you'll do. That's something the car will do for you if somebody steps out in front of it. Um, are you happy about that? It's very interesting. I mean, back in, and um, this is by no means an exaggeration, in the late 80s, um, anyone remember Lucas in the UK who did automotive things? Um, I remember visiting them, um, and they had a brake-by-wire system for a car. I said, this is fantastic. They said, yeah, perfectly works, everything there. I said, great. They said, well, not so great, because it's not going to be socially acceptable to have brake-by-wire in a car anytime soon. Um, so there we are. Um, virtualization does not provide security. Um, that's well worth noting. Um, if you've any doubts about that, I did go on the National Vulnerability Database very quickly last night. So this is a printout from last night. Um, here's um, a whole bunch of high severi um, se um, severity uh, 7.8, 7.6, 10 high um, on various different VMware virtualization um, products. So virtualization does not in itself provide security. Um, virtualization can be secure um, and this is kind of the architecture that we adopt. So you can have again at the lowest level here we've got multi-core or single CPU um, down here, um, the separation kernel sits on top of that. So again, a very small footprint code sits on top of that. And then on top of that, you could, this could be an industrial application or it could be a medical device um, or anything like that. You've got in separate memory spaces different components, high, avail high availability applications, real-time applications, your different drivers. Um, USB, web browsers, things like that. And then over here, guested one or any number of different operating systems. I mean, that's, you know, even an old example there was with, with Symbian. 
but really you can guess anything um, securely on top of the, the technology down there and I'll show you a little bit more about that in a couple of slides. Um, providing military grade trust to consumer multimedia devices. Um, this is something that this is an ongoing project right now. I just, um, I'll turn this device on in a moment and just show you something really quickly here. Um, this is something that's ongoing with a, with a big, actually multiple US carriers right now, um, where they want to have the concept of trusted mobile devices um, for government mm, stroke military type use cases. Um, there, are, there are devices out there that, that do this type of stuff at the top here. Um, they're very, very expensive. I mean, in some cases, ten, twenty thousand dollars or more. Um, and the consequence is they're not that very well, they're not that well deployed. Um, and they're used in very, very specific scenarios. Um, what they want to be able to do is take a, a, a more of a consumer type device like, you know, this a Samsung Google phone um, and enable it to become a trusted mobile device. And um, we'll have a look at that in just a second. But before we do, how would that work? So the concept really is to have multi-domain security um, on a phone. Um, something that you would be able to have a trusted payment system on or, or things like that. So again, mobile hardware. Um, in this case, ARM-based multi-core hardware. Um, you're running integrity, that's our separation kernel on top of that. And then you've got the option of one or more guests. Um, you may be just running one version of Android. In this particular example I'm showing you, you're, you'll pretty much see this, so two, two versions of Android. Um, Android itself, um, we from our point of view, we're not doing anything to add into Android to make it safer. Some of you guys would be doing additional layers on top of the Android part to, to lock it down and do the things that you would want to do to make Android in the way it um, communicates with the things that you want it to do um, to make it more secure. Um, what we do have is we have encrypted file systems so, um, and, um, and VPNs that can live down here. Um, so, you know, we can do that aspect. Um, outside of that, because again, some people have said, well, you know, we need to audit what's going on with Android and, you know, what if Android, um, this Android here, um, wants to use um, <coughs> Wi-Fi, we might say, yeah, that's okay. Well, what if this one does? Well, yes, but only perhaps through an encrypted uh, channel, something like that. Then that's something that can be controlled at this, this level here. Or you see this area that lives between the two, <coughs> This is where other things can happen as well. Just like in the previous slides, different applications can run in that space. So if you had a, you know, if a bank came to us and said, well, for example, you know, we'd like to have a secure client running outside of Android to communicate with the bank, um, can we do that? The answer is, well, yes, of course. You, you, you can run an application in this space, which lives outside of Android. You can switch to it, do that transaction, and then switch back. So the idea of you know, someone having domain one as their personal space, um, domain two as their corporate space, where domain two is only ever enabled by corporate IT, um, this is very doable today. And I'll, I'll just very quickly show you um, the example of that. Um, that's what it looks like just in, in slightly different terms. So there's the, the picture. In the middle space, this trust environment, you can run all sorts of um, out of band from Android applications as I, I just described. But essentially, um, you know, an Android phone which, as I turned it on, comes up with a green LED at the bottom. Um, I can turn it on uh, and go into it and I've got my Android and use my apps and things like that. Then either by using a, uh, an icon on the, the um, keypad here or using a button on the side, um, If I then switch it on, it comes up with a different screen, and this screen says enter password. That's because it's, at the moment, trying to access the um, enterprise partition, which is locked down. The fact that this even comes up in the first place would be something that would be enabled by IT. So as a device, this was just a single Android 
um, instance phone, which you know you got from the local store, and now you want to use this in your local government scenario or your corporate scenario, and IT say, yeah, we support that phone, and then they they enable the second um, instance of Android, um, which is locked down to your corporate environment, um, and they can allow or disallow um, different facilities on the device. And now we just go in here, I just say this bit, uh, you just have to trust me with at the moment. This is prototype, so even this might not work. Great. It didn't. Nothing like a... So here's another one I prepared earlier. <laughs> so, got my keyboard. I say I did steal it from the engineer, so... So, essentially, here's another Android. So, red is this version of Android, this type of background. If I switch it, it's now green. That version of Android, different color background. Um, what about the other aspects of the enterprise? Well, again, what I told you earlier, um, we work with um, a bunch of people who who have these, these separate net networks typically. So what we've done is we've taken the very same integrity operating system that is, is in um, primary flight, flight computers on planes like the F-35 and the Eurofighter and in engine monitoring systems on the A380 and the new 787 and things like that and use that same technology in medical devices, um, in cars um, and also in the desktop. Um, that one of the slides right at the beginning showed on the right hand side um, a company called Integrity Global Security um, as one of our daughter companies that, that, that do this type of technology for the desktop. So the idea, you know, here's a, a desktop computer. It has um, three um, Ethernet cards, three hard drives, and replaces those three separate computers on the desk with a, this separation technology um, and this could be three different classification levels or it could be on a secure notebook um, or it could be um, a, an internet client where you basically got your corporate environment but you want to you know basically some window you can switch to which just allows you to do open internet access and things like that secure cloud gateways secure private cloud things like that um, if this any of this is interesting then catch me over lunch um, um, some of our customers in the corporate space want to protect their assets. For a lot of them, um, they're not even sure how their network's really laid out, so protecting their assets is, is something they want to do, but first they've, they've their own planning exercise to, to figure out, well, where are our assets stored on our servers and which servers and how can we isolate the, them and things like that. But again, you can use this same separation type of technology to, to separate your... Um, assets out. Just real quickly, I, I just want to mention um, things like crypto toolkits down at the embedded level is, is really important as well. You're used to these sort of things at, on the desktop and server space. Device lifecycle management, really important as well. You know, how do you tell that that, that, that network switch or, or router that you've just purchased is a genuine one from, you know, brand X? Because we've all read the stories, right, of the different boxes that you think are a you know, a Cisco this, that, or the other, and it transpires that they're not. Um, well, device lifecycle management is one of the ways that you do this, so that actually as the microprocessor itself within the unit is manufactured, um, you're using basically key um, technology, which traces it all the way up through the system into the end equipment, and then when you buy a system, you can even interrogate it all the way back and say, well, yes, I know I bought that device. It's a brand X, and it does this. Um, and that's exactly what it is and it hasn't been tampered with. Really important in you know, things like um, smart energy where you've got um, water meters and things like that. You know, this, is, this is an area where the whole smart energy industry at the moment and, um, uh, is, is going through a little bit of a, um, a discussion process and you know, how do we do this right? How do we make sure that, that the meter we're interrogating hasn't been tampered with and it's really a meter that was supplied by by those people and it's got the genuine processor in and, and so on and so forth. You know, this is really important because 
you know, we all want to know we're, 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 we're going to pay the right amount for our, our bills, don't we? And, and as was said by earlier speakers, you know, if you can exploit a system for, for financial gain, you will. So people will try and do all of these things. Um, you know, just in summary, really, you know, connected devices. Um, I know the guy's kind of doing something quite funny there, but, you know, if I said to you, well, how many connected devices are on your home, you know, wireless router, if you're an average, you know, family with a couple of teenage kids, then it's more than you think, actually. I think I connected about 14 or counted about 14 or 15 on mine. You know, it's, it's mobile phones and it's, you know, laptops and it's, you know, the wireless printer and everything else. It soon builds up. And if, if you look at that in terms of, you know, the, ho the hospital, um, the hospital, you know, connected devices in the hospital. How do you make all of those safe? How many of them are connected? The surgeon wants to use his tablet to, to access all this equipment. You know, all of this stuff is going to be going on if it's not already. You know, how do we do it safely? Um, just want to stimulate you into thinking of, you know, outside of, of perhaps the areas that you're, you're normally thinking about. Um, number of attacks on these types of devices, just as in the, in, in the desktop and server space, continues to grow. Software is becoming even more complex. You know, talk to me over lunch about next generation cars and, and these new 2D, 3D dashboards and things like that. It, it's it's mind-blowingly complex what's going into you know, even, you, you know, mid-range cars in the next few years. Um, Multi-core processors, very familiar to you guys in the desktop and, and server space, of course. They're finding their way into embedded devices. You know, dual-core and quad-core computing in these types of devices is, is, already, is already happening today. Um, of course, Again, in the desktop and server space, if you're using something like Intel vPro technology and things like that, then you, know, you can have trusted boot or use security extensions on the hardware. And that's what we do when I showed you those, um, those systems, um, integrity, global security systems, where um, you've got three domains and three network cards and three hard drives. Um, trusted boot is part of that process. If somebody takes the case off of that, that uh, desktop computer, um, that whole system shuts down and th that system is not going to boot thereafter because it has modified BIOS, it uses trusted boot technology. Um, this is exactly what people want to, uh, to have on those type of devices in those environments. And that may be overkill for, the, for your type of environment. So, you know, please don't assume that, you know, this is something that, that you will have to have. Um, crypto libraries, yes, use them where, where you can. Device lifecycle management in terms of those uh, areas that we talked about becoming important. Separation kernel architecture. If you're looking at any um, devices like this and medical devices or industrial plants or airplanes or cars, um, this is really the only way to go. Um, putting drivers and, and other things into sin single monoliths of code and, and, and throwing them all into the system and then any one bug or any one hack and the whole system is compromised or freezes up is, is just something that is not acceptable today. As consumers, we've probably been having that um, happen to us you know, many times over the years. Perhaps our set-top box is frozen or our phone is frozen or our, you know, we've all got examples of where that's happened on the desktop too. Um, and that's just a bit about um, us. But, you know, it really, you know, it is possible using the separation uh, kernel architecture to get to a point where um, over a period of, of, of years, as you replace old, uh, redundant, um, obsolete equipment and you bring in new, that if, if the new technology uses the right pedigree of um, technology, then you can build up a network which could be truly secure. Um, until that time, of course, um, you know, we all, we're all doing our bit, right? And everything that the speakers have talked about this morning is really important. Um, but of course, if just one network device switch sitting out there is, is, is being hacked into, um, as was a case recently, uh, there was a vulnerability just in closing. Um, very well-known manufacturer had uh, 
uh, an operating system in that, that switch where the, all the debug channels were left on. And you could actually go do a search for these devices on the internet and produce uh, them all really quickly. Um, and then you could actually get break into that device. So um, actually our IPv6 um, comms engineer decided that that might be interesting to have a look at. So just within our own internal network, um, not outward facing, he, he found that we had one of these devices, actually in one of our other offices. So he thought, oh, okay, I'll follow the, I'll follow the, the black hat type instructions on, on this and see if I can get into it. Um, and sure enough, he did, and he got root level access, and he could actually you know, completely change the, the routing of all the traffic coming in and, and push it all out in a different direction and everything else. So um, just think about some of these other aspects because they form the bigger picture of everything that we talked about today. Now, I did what I said I wouldn't do and went five minutes over, so I do apologize for that. Anyway, um, thank you very much. For there you are. Nice.